Good afternoon. I'm David Van Slyke. I have the privilege to serve as the Dean of Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. It is my honor to welcome you to the spring 2021 edition of our Tanner Lecture Series. Up front, I would especially like to thank Kelly and Jackie of the Campbell Public Affairs Institute and Maxwell's Information and Computing Technology Department. I would like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people upon whose ancestral lands our university now stands. We are grateful to Maxwell graduate and advisory board member, Dr. Lynn Tanner, who has generously endowed this very special lecture series that benefits our students, our faculty, our university, and the community. Lynn has built an extraordinary career spanning education and the private sector. For 30 years, he has been involved with leading and expanding Tech Canada, where he serves as president. Lynn has done remarkable work accelerating the growth, development, and success of 21st century business leaders throughout Canada and around the world. I especially thank Lynn and his wife, Margaret, for their generosity to Maxwell and for the thoughtful counsel they have and continue to provide to me as Dean. Since 2012, the Tanner Lecture Series has provided Maxwell the opportunity to bring some of the most prominent civic doers and thinkers of our time to visit campus and speak on ethics, citizenship, and public responsibility. Previous leaders include Senator Bill Bradley, Governor Lincoln Chaffee, Maxwell alum and former university president, health and human services secretary, and congressional representative Donna Shalala, and Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. They have engaged and challenged us. I have no doubt that today's distinguished speaker will do the same. Personally, as a reader of Consumer Reports, I'm excited to hear Marta speak about the opportunities we each have to contribute to reclaiming trust in an age of misinformation, especially because she takes a broad view of public service and the contributions that each of us can and should make to improving the public good. There is no doubt that the Maxwell School is known for its outstanding faculty. Among our more than 200 instructors, teachers, and scholars, we are fortunate to benefit from the service and leadership of Dr. Grant Rear. Grant is a professor of political science and director of the Campbell Public Affairs Institute. Many of you also know Grant as creator, host, and producer of the Campbell Conversations on, on WRBO Public Media, an award-winning weekly regional NPR public affairs show featuring in-depth interviews with regional and national writers, politicians, activists, public officials, and business professionals. Few people that I know are as knowledgeable of or as passionate about public service and citizenship than our colleague Grant Rear. I will now turn the microphone over to Grant and look forward to him leading this afternoon's event. Grant? Thank you, Dave. Um, I want to thank you for your support and leadership regarding this series and of the school more generally. Uh, and I too want to welcome and thank Lynn Tanner, uh, Margaret, and their family. Before I introduce Marta, let me just mention a few logistics about how this evening will go. Uh, the event is being recorded and it will be available for viewing soon after the event on the Campbell Institute webpage and on the Maxwell School's YouTube channel. Our format is that Marta will speak for about 45 minutes or so, give or take, and then we'll move to a Q&A session. And for that session, we will use the Q&A function in the webinar here. So please post your questions in that box and we will get to as many of them as we can. Just type in your question in the dialog box and then hit enter to place it in the queue so that we can see it. Now, this is the time when I would normally be also inviting you to join us for an in-person reception 
which would have included both food and drink. Um, but instead, I will just invite you to have a nice dinner on your own after you have heard from Marta and had a chance to ask her a question. Uh, let me just say a few words about our speaker. I think Marta Tolado, uh, president and CEO of Consumer Reports, perfectly embodies the vision of the Tanner Lecture Series with its emphasis on generative leadership activity dedicated to the public good and to the idea that both individuals and organizations can do well by doing good and do good through doing well. Marta's work in consumer advocacy and consumer citizenship goes back to the beginnings of her professional career when she worked with Ralph Nader. Her public service continued with her work for Senator Bill Bradley, whom the Dean mentioned and who was our inaugural Tanner lecturer, and is the executive director of the Domestic Policy Group at the Aspen Institute and vice president of the Partnership for Public Service, which is an organization very near and dear to Maxwell Hartz, where she launched the Service to America Awards. As vice president at the Ford Foundation, she advocated for economic fairness, internet access, and civil rights. At Consumer Reports, where she's been president and CEO since 2014, Marta has led transformational change, taking America's foremost consumer organization from a subscription organization to a membership organization with 6 million members and pursuing a number of initiatives dedicated to truth, transparency, fairness, and inclusion. The timing of her leadership couldn't be better, as Consumer Reports has provided necessary information, empowerment, and advocacy precisely when government safeguards and easily accessible, reliable information necessary for informed decision making are under threat. Reliable information is an essential part of citizenship, and we need organizations like Consumer Reports, and we need their leadership to be innovative, proactive, and forward thinking as Marta's leadership has been. Now, finally, I'm going to add a personal note here that I just cannot resist putting in. And that is in addition to, and before all of those accomplishments, Marta was also the starting pitcher on our championship softball team at Yale. She earned the nickname of the goose, even though her favorite team, as I remember at the time, was the Mets. And I was fortunate enough to be the manager of that team for a season. And so I get to exercise the manager's prerogative by calling Marta back to the mound one more time. Marta, welcome to Maxwell and the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Grant. Uh, I'm, I'm catching my breath from, from that uh, wonderfully warm, uh, and blast from the past introduction. <laughs> it's great to be here with you all. My thanks to everyone at the Max School School who made this possible. I had very much also wanted to be with you in person last year about this time, but the world has changed over the last year due to COVID and Zoom is the way we congregate safely. So I'm glad to spend this time with you all in this particular forum. I myself didn't attend Syracuse, but I do have that strong orange connection. Uh, and, and you should know that in our very C-suite, um, the person I have who is, is uh, directing all of our board engagement with the Board of Consumer Reports is a proud Syracuse graduate. So not only did I uh, get to play softball with uh, Professor Reher, um, but we, we are proud to have some of your graduates working for us. And of course, it is such an honor for me because the um, first Tanner lecture was delivered by someone who was my boss, my mentor, and now my friend for many years, Senator Bill Bradley. So I feel extraordinarily privileged and honored to be with you today, continuing a conversation about ethics and public service, our individual and collective responsibility. And I think these themes could not be more relevant today and that they certainly have animated many of the choices that I've made in my career. So I feel quite at home with you here today. Now to the students gathered here, I salute you for making it through such an incredibly challenging time and for keeping your focus on safety and on your future. 
Given this moment of transformation that we're living in, we need thoughtful, engaged, public-minded individuals out there in the world who are doing good and restoring trust in our defining institutions. So we need your help to instill in our society the very values that you are sharpening here at the Maxwell School. In short, we need you to graduate. And I wanna give a special shout out also to Dean Slyke, but also to Dr. Lynn Tanner and his family for creating this marvelous lecture series around public responsibility. This is indeed a time of great uncertainty, but I also believe it's a moment of tremendous opportunity. Opportunity to lead, to make a difference, and to contribute in ways large and small. So I hope that my remarks today underscore that making a difference can take many forms, many paths. And I, for one, am here to tell you that I did not lay awake at night asking or thinking about one day I'm going to lead the biggest, most trusted consumer organization in America at a time when trust and misinformation looms so large. So let me start with my own story of opportunity to set the context. When I was two years old, my parents found themselves in the midst of a revolution in the tiny island of Cuba, 90 miles off the coast of Florida. And the principles they cared about, the freedom to speak, to make choices for their family, and to participate in a democracy were evaporating. So with a great deal of trepidation, they boarded a plane with my three brothers and me, and we left Havana to a new home, Newark, New Jersey. Now leaving their country broke their heart, but their journey for a free and open society really became the opening chapter of my own story. And it had a profound impact on my life and many of the roads that I've taken. For starters, their sacrifice made me very grateful for the many people and opportunities that my new country offered. And it also led me to find ways to contribute to the belief that democratic freedoms could coexist with equity. I became committed to ensuring that my parents' heartbreak would not be in vain. Now, I grew up in America as an immigrant, a refugee, just a normal American kid. We were in search of security and stability. But no sooner did we arrive in the US that we became part of a society that was in the midst of enormous change and disruption. In 1963, JFK was assassinated. In 1967, Newark, my new hometown, erupted in four days of violence and civil unrest. 26 people died. In 68, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were assassinated. And in 1974, Nixon resigned. So in the midst of all this political instability, however, there were new voices, diverse voices, rising to be heard and empowered. And with a considerable effort fighting every step of the way, those courageous individuals helped usher in sweeping new laws and protections that moved us closer to achieving the promise of a country truly of the people and by the people. The Equal Pay Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Clean Water Act, and so many consumer protections and agencies that we now take for granted. So the message for me was change can be won. Many of the people behind these movements did not hold public positions of power. They weren't elected officials. But what united all of them was a conviction, both morally and ethically, that change in our society was necessary and that they could make a difference. Now, if you're driven by ideas, you go to grad school. If you're driven to make change, you pursue public service, or at least that is what was reinforced explicitly and implicitly when I was getting my graduate degree. But what if you wanna do both? If you wanna pursue the passionate link between ideas and action? Well, I'm here to tell you it's doable, it's fulfilling, and you can earn a living. And I'm sure your parents wanna hear that. The path for me wasn't a straight line. As Grant mentioned, I began interning, and I will say it was a non-paying internship with Ralph Nader's Public Citizen after college. I went to grad school. 
I dropped out to work on some political campaigns. I went back to grad school, went to work at a think tank in DC, the Aspen Institute, and then was recruited to work for my home state, Senator Bill Bradley. Now I caught my breath when he came up short in the bid to get the Democratic nomination for president. Now, the moral of that story is never challenge a sitting vice president, but it did give me the opportunity to finish my dissertation. But I got restless after nearly 15 years in Washington, I was hungry to explore new avenues to make a difference. And so I spent 10 years at the Ford Foundation and that's one of the largest, most well-endowed social justice philanthropies in the world, investing in change with global organizations, seeding big ideas like public media, microfinance, and shaping a free and fair internet. And so now here I am leading Consumer Reports, as I said, one of the largest consumer advocacy organizations in the country. And this year we are celebrating 85 years. Now you may know Consumer Reports from our product safety investigations, our 80 labs testing and reporting on the quality of consumer products, our research and survey work, tapping into the sentiment of millions of consumers every year. And then of course, there's that 375 acre auto test center where we test all our cars. Now, all of our work is published online. We still have a monthly magazine. It is the passion of many of our members still today in a digital environment, but we are supported by our members who believe in what we do and trust the information we provide. And I wanna underscore the words believe and trust. Here's what you may not know about us. We're also an advocacy organization. We were created during the Great Depression, 1936, to help rebuild an economy that was based on trust and transparency back when those things were rare in the marketplace. In the 30s, new technologies, new companies were transforming the economy, electricity, telephones, the automobile were changing the very way that people lived. Products were becoming more complex and more dangerous. It was the heyday of regular unregulated medicines, pseudoscientific fads, household products that were literally containing radioactive materials. New mediums like radio and television were communicating more information than ever before. And much of it was either paid for, unvetted, and blurred the lines between fact, fiction, and slick advertising. The balance of power at that point and at that time was shifting to sellers. And with that came an erosion of trust. Now, does any of that sound familiar given the challenges we face today? Truth? transparency, facts, science. At the dawn of the advertising age, CR was founded to give consumers accurate, independent information in a time of misinformation and to advocate for a marketplace that was transparent and fair and one that consumers could trust. Our founders wanted to level the playing field. They wanted to grow consumer power in a way that could actually shape the marketplace and incentivize manufacturers to put people before profits. The founders of Consumer Reports had a theory, employ rigorous research by comparative scientific testing methods, expose fact and fiction, create standards, codify laws, and enforcement mechanisms. That particular model shamed the bad actors and it served as a catalyst for social change. And CR was and remains the most iconic social enterprise in US history. It raised enough revenue to inhabit 125,000 square feet of lab space and to deploy a team of experts in Washington to turn consumer needs into enduring consumer rights. Today, we have over 600 people working at Consumer Reports. We helped advocate for laws to protect consumers like the Wheeler Act in 1938 to outlaw unfair and deceptive practices in commerce. We also advocated for the Food and Drug Administration's regulatory powers to be expanded in response to poisoning deaths. We brought attention to the dangers of cigarettes, the presence of radioactive materials in milk. We got soclimates out of soft drinks. 
We fought for better child safety seats, anti-lock brakes, mandatory seat belts, and the list goes on. But what distinguished us was our adherence to science, evidence, and experts to guide our work and relying on facts to speak for us. And if we were, of course, we were beholden to no one other than consumers. We were independent and we're a nonprofit. We accepted no advertising or corporate donations, and this is true to this day. So CR remains powered by scientific innovation, but also social innovation. The majority of our revenue is earned. So I run a business essentially, a social enterprise, and raised by our members and philanthropic donors. Now as a social enterprise, we have a double bottom line. That means we're raising our operating income and pouring that back into the strategies we employ to create the impact we wanna see in the marketplace. CR is trusted by consumers, but its integrity and its independence has also earned the trust of government and manufacturers. It became what many, many companies in the private sector strive for, a trusted brand. Social historians like to identify the consumer movement's inflection points as the progressive era, the New Deal recovery programs, the post-World War II era when real wages climbed after 1950. By the mid 50s, two thirds of American households had acquired their first televisions. They brought life insurance and they owned credit cards. And in the 60s, of course, Ralph Nader's unsafe at any speed transformed the auto industry's attitude towards safety standards. I believe we now may be at another inflection point. We are living in the midst of a digital revolution that has completely upended commerce, changed the way we communicate and transformed the way we get our news and information and channeled the economy through a very small number of companies that now have inordinate power. You know this all too well. Our lives over the last year during the pandemic have only grown more dependent on the digital marketplace and the business model that powers that. And it is not a consumer first model. It is monopolistic in several new ways that current laws are not fit to address. Its business model is opaque. The very algorithms that make decisions affecting our data and our lives is shrouded in secrecy. And it is targeting you, following you, selling you, and controlling what it learns about you for profit. And perhaps most consequentially, it is shaping what you see and what you don't see when you inhabit the digital marketplace. The most powerful digital companies are not just shaping the marketplace, they have become the marketplace, shifting the balance of power away from consumers and putting at risk our choices, our privacy, and our access to information we can trust. 87% of online searches are run through Google. 70% of the populations of the US and Canada are on Facebook, and that is almost 2.5 billion people worldwide. Apple controls a vertically integrated walled off collection of products and services that are used by over a billion people. And Amazon, in addition to being a retailer, it is now a marketing platform, a delivery and logistics network, a payment service, a credit lender, an auction house, a major book publisher, a producer of television and films, fashion designer, hardware manufacturer, and perhaps most profitably, a leading host of cloud server space. In just 2020 holiday season, roughly 40 cents of every dollar was spent on the Amazon platform. Now this new line app uh, marketplace is replicating many of the inequities, the discrimination and the biases that we fought 
so hard to expose and purge in the social economy of the analog world. Algorithms that introduce bias into the prices we pay and the options that are available to us. Advertisers who pay for preferential treatment so they can manipulate our searches. Online reviews that are bought and paid for. And something called dynamic pricing. And that is simply that I may go on the internet to search for an airline ticket. And by seeing my zip code, I may get charged more or less for that same ticket. The business model for these companies is based on us. We're the product. Our data, our choices, our interest, our public discussions, everything we do online. And the level of monitoring and tracking of our every move that companies have over our digital footprint. It's very akin to what my parents described to me, what it was like when they left Cuba in a totalitarian system where you feel all eyes are on you and your, and your freedoms are diminished. Ironically, today we live in what Shoshona Zuboff in her book has coined the era of surveillance capitalism. Facebook with 2.4 billion global users tracks our likes and dislikes, tracks what we read, what we ignore, and then it reinforces those things, those interests that we have and share to capture more of our time. So is it any wonder that our views get hyper-polarized? But they know from the research that they conduct on us that tapping into and reinforcing our own biases and emotional touch points keep us connected longer and that generates more revenue for them. Even during the pandemic, we saw Facebook allowing blatant misinformation that was jeopardizing the lives of Americans. CR conducted a test. We submitted to Facebook a number of fake ads on COVID including one that recommended that the public should drink bleach to inoculate itself from the virus. Sadly, every one of our fake ads was accepted by their content moderation. Of course, we didn't publish them, but this is just one test that tells you that the self-policing and the moderation of misinformation is so paltry and so weak and so dangerous. And then of course, on January 6th, millions of people watched a violent insurrection take place at the Capitol building that was fueled by misinformation and lies that threatened our very democratic process. So the ultimate question, what do we do about it? How do consumers maintain agency? How do we tip back the scales of power given the current imbalance? If we are indeed at a historic inflection point, how can we bend the marketplace to be transparent, fair, safe, and just? And how do we grow consumer power to make that happen? Many feel we are at a tipping point, that the days of self-policing tech monopolies are waning, that the naivete and optimism that has fueled so much of our handing over of our data for the quote unquote free use of products and services may finally be turning to delayed skepticism. According to CR survey research that was cited recently by the House Judiciary Subcommittee report on antitrust issues, three out of four respondents agree that big tech companies have too much power. These companies are already in court for charges of anti-competitiveness and there are efforts underway to change the antitrust laws to help rein in the practices of these companies. And some companies are acknowledging the need to make change in part because they also sense a sea change of public opinion. Google's agreed to stop selling ads based on our browsing history. Twitter has begun to recognize the dangers of misinformation. And Facebook has finally agreed under pressure from ranking digital rights and other organizations to release a corporate human rights policy. So how do we step up? How does Consumer Reports step up? As great as these challenges are, with them, I believe comes great opportunity. 
my own opportunity along with the members of CR to lead this organization to renewed relevance. Now, as proud as I am that Consumer Reports has been behind many of the efforts to instill the consumer protections and rights in place today, right up until the founding of the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau following the crash of 2008, many of these laws, agencies, and enforcement mechanism don't fully address the consumer harms I've been describing that are present today in the digital marketplace. So what do you do when no standards exist? When political incrementalism and ideological polarization cause stagnation? And when some agencies do not have the resources to be effective watchdogs? How does an 85-year-old social enterprise innovate to remain relevant, to have impact in the public interest, and as I mentioned, grow consumer power just as the consumer power movement did a century ago? One word, transformation. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the level of transformation. We know it's difficult to hardwire accountability when the government is four and five steps behind the companies that are creating innovation. But that doesn't mean that it has to be a race to the bottom. In the absence of digital standards that provide for us a baseline for connected products and the growing internet of things, consumers can't make informed decisions. So to course correct, we opened and stood up a digital lab, creating a digital standard that is an open source framework that raises the bar for companies and manufacturers. We show companies exactly what they can do to score more highly on these things like privacy and data security. Now in applying the standard to a range of products like connected doorbells, Wi-Fi routers, we've discovered all kinds of basic security flaws. Now, by calling them out, we help consumers ensure that the product or the service that they're getting is better, it's safer, and it's more secure. Just recently, for example, actually, it was a year ago, I can't believe it's been a year since we've been on this pandemic journey, but at the outset of the pandemic, when Zoom was attracting tens of millions of new participants a week, we identified some privacy concerns. And to their credit, they fixed them. But if we're going to achieve a consumer first marketplace, we also need a more capable and technologically agile government. We are seeing a concerted effort now to bring in more public interest technologists who understand the implications of this technology. They're being asked to shape the necessary protections and identify innovations in real time. The creation of the internet was in fact a government project in the first place. Technology in the public interest is a term I think we're gonna be hearing a lot more of. Now, secondly, we also have to realize in our transformation journey, that in a crowded and competitive landscape of quote unquote free reviews, you have to be where consumers are. For CR, that meant new partnerships, new platforms. We no longer can be complacent and wait for consumers to find us. So some of those platforms took the form of publishing on things like The Root. It is a platform, a very dynamic platform whose principal audience are African-Americans. We have to engage new audiences wherever they are. And we felt some of the investigations and publishing that we were doing on racial bias in medical algorithms is important. And we also experimented with educational television programming on Telemundo. That's not anything CR has ever done in the past, but it's mission critical. We have to be where consumers are. We need to show up wherever people are to inform their choices, 
with trusted information. But here's the next B. It has to be at the point of decision. Folks aren't just walking in uh, to a location, particularly at a pandemic, to make decisions, purchasing decisions. So how do you do that? How do you grow the number of people that we can serve? And we landed on a program that we call CR Recommended. It's a stamp of approval. And you don't have to be a member to benefit from it. Consumers will know when they see us in store or online, which products meet our rigorous standards. And that matters a lot, especially when you're considering a child's car seat and where safety is the most utmost importance. It matters because we assume that all the products that come to the market have been approved or vetted, but unfortunately that's not the case. But more importantly, it gives access to recommendations around safety and transparency and value and quality to all consumers in all communities. Now, we're also harnessing data for social good. And what does that mean? It's one of the most exciting areas of experimentation. We use statistical analysis of a massive trove of data in partnership with others. As you know, data is our, uh, I would say, one of the most precious assets. Consumers may want a portion of that data, but over time, that data begins to tell a story about the safety of a particular vehicle, a particular insurance product. So how do you, how do you look at that data and give it an audience. We began to partner with organizations, new organizations like The Markup. It's a new data-driven journalism outlet to identify algorithmic bias. Things, and a, and a concrete example was an, an algorithm that charges you more for car insurance, not because you have failed on a number of driving factors, but perhaps you live in the wrong neighborhood, according to the algorithm. It also charges you more based on your race, not your driving record. So this whole field of data journalism is a way to reveal some of the biases in the data. We're also now using EPA data to determine the level of emissions for cars and trucks as part of a concerted effort around sustainability. And you're gonna be seeing many of the cars that we do review will now have a green choice. And that's exciting news based on electric vehicles, low carbon fuels. We need to move the market toward a more sustainable path. We also ask consumers to share information with us in an effort to move the market. And one example is we ask consumers to share their cable bills. Now, why would we do that? Well, we asked them as part of what we called our WTF program. And that means what the fee campaign. People sent in their cable bills by the thousands, allowing us to collect data that resulted in a new law that prevents cable companies from slipping in hidden fees on your cable bills. And trust me, Hidden fees are not just creeping into your cable bills, they're creeping into many, many of the bills that you pay automatically. In a feature story that's out next week, our investigative journalism in partnership with The Guardian, we brought people across the country in their homes to test their tap water. Now this is gonna be our lead article next month, so spoiler alert, the level of toxic, what we call forever PFAS chemicals is disturbing, if not shocking. And it demonstrates the need to establish a stronger drinking water standard. It has been incredibly eye-opening to bring our testing into the public realm and into people's homes to share and to be included in the evaluations we do. But investigations in data analytics 
can and must go beyond the gotcha. In a world of rapid product cycles and software updates, the model of waiting for a product to land in the marketplace, be reviewed, and then critiquing it for its shortcomings can't possibly keep up with the pace of change in product innovation. We have to disrupt the marketplace by finding ways to use our consumer-driven data insights to impact product design in what we call upstream, upstream in the product cycle. So our data intelligence team is working on precisely that, using CR's rigorous and trusted research, testing, and surveys to inform regulators, industry experts, manufacturers, and researchers. And the goal of that new program is really to inform the design and development of products, standards, and policies to better prioritize consumer safety, security, performance, and quality. A consumer first mindset needs to be built into the very design of products from the start. Now, we need to be at the table when products and services are being designed and developed so we can inform that process before a harm occurs and there's an infraction that we need to chase after. In the absence of corporate responsibility, corporate accountability, or government action, a trusted brand like CR can move markets. We can incentivize manufacturers to make the market more equitable. In the area of safety, we succeeded in making seatbelts mandatory. That was 1968. But today, safety is defined by the life-saving technology in your car, like highway speed automatic emergency braking, blind spot warning, just to name a few. Now, in 2019, with pedestrian deaths on the rise, we told automakers that a vehicle must have pedestrian detection technology as a standard feature, not a luxury add-on, to be part of Consumer Reports' top pick. And we would award extra points on our ratings for cars and trucks that have it. In one year, the number of new cars and trucks with this safety feature increased by 38% of the market to 61% of the market. And the number continues to increase. For 2021, it's roughly 72%, nearly double what it was two years ago. CER has 6 million members, a track record of legislative accomplishments, investigative journalism that reveals truth in our effort to grow consumer power. And certainly during the early months of the COVID pandemic, over 18 million people were coming to our COVID hub online for information about how to stay safe, how to clean their home, what were the masking protocols, how to pump gas safely. The public is searching for information they can trust. And by shaping the marketplace in favor of consumers, and addressing misinformation, that's gonna require more than CR's ability to transform and innovate. The purchasing power of consumers has enormous influence in changing corporate behavior, no question. Three quarters of the GDP, including healthcare, is consumer spending. And we need to support brands that adopt meaningful pro-consumer policies with the power of our wallets. But these digital giants must be accountable, and our government needs to regain its footing. We need to grow consumer champions across party lines. Online privacy should be a right, not a setting on your devices. Connected products should be private, and they should not share your data by default. You shouldn't be home trying to figure out how to do that. The onus should not be on consumers. You should have the ability to know the information that companies collect about you. And the online searches you make should be unbiased, trustworthy, and transparent. Everyone should have ownership and control 
of their own data. Now, I spoke earlier of leaders, leaders who rose up to inspire change through unofficial avenues of power. They have names like Martin Luther King, Rachel Carson, Ralph Nader, Gloria Steinem, Dolores Huerta, and others. They gave people what they needed, knowledge and inspiration to put power into their own hands. You are part of this institution and we're all here today because we share the same desire to make a difference. The Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs provides an extraordinary vehicle to prepare yourself for that opportunity. It's a daunting task. There are many Goliaths, but I believe we are at a critical time. We are at an inflection point on rebuilding trust, on creating a fair and transparent marketplace, on racial justice, on the value and the importance of effective government, on corporate accountability. So choose your path, public service, social entrepreneurship, philanthropy, law, journalism. Your transformational and ethical leadership is so greatly needed. My hope is that the journey that you choose brings us closer to realizing that democracy can coexist with equity. Thank you so much. And I look forward to a discussion. Thanks, Marta. Uh, that was wonderful. And we've got uh, several really interesting questions that build off of some of the things that you've been talking about. Um, let me just start with one, and, and, and this one is, is um, from someone that preferred to remain anonymous, which is fine. Uh, but uh, it, it gets at this challenge that, that you kind of hinted at a couple places there about the current climate that we're living in. There is so much emphasis on, well, that's just one person's opinion, or this is that truth. Here's an alternative set of facts, and so on and so on. How do you then maintain the trust in some of these initiatives that you're talking about against the criticism that might be leveled that, well, you know, the people that are coming out higher on CR stamp of approval and rankings paid for that in some way? Um, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you convince people um, that it is truly objective in that way? Well, I think you have to develop a record and a, a, of, and a reputation of integrity and independence. And, and I think that that is unquestioned. And I would say that that is our greatest single asset, is maintaining that independence. So there was a lot of debate, Grant, when we decided we need to do a CR recommended program. Mm. Um, and what the impetus was, was that there, when we're talking about safety, there are many consumers who perhaps can't afford a membership, can't get access behind our paywall because we have to self-fund some of this information. So how do we do that? How do we reach those communities? And how do we create a model that is not what you described, pay to play? I will, I will, um, review your product for a price. We did not change our protocols. We continue to rate the products as we do and according to consumer need. And they can license the CR recommended uh, label for a short period of time because we have to continually go back and really enforce, have an enforcement mechanism that you can't misuse the label. And so right now it exists virtually. And what you can do is take your phone and go to the QR code and see the whole range of products in that category that we, are, we have tested against the product you're looking at. So what we're really self-funding is the enforcement and monitoring of that program. 
we are not, it, it is um, the, the cap that we have put on it is not a pay to play price point. Mm. So I think what we, what we decided is that we must, must, must um, that there's too much at stake not to get in front of so many of the pay to play labels that are out in the market. And when we did the survey research, we learned that consumers put a great amount of trust in those marks. And for us to be absent from those marks is not an option. Mm. Another question in the same vein, I'll, I'll add a couple aspects to it, but you know, your, your organization is distinctly nonpartisan, as you made clear, stridently nonpartisan, but you also mentioned the deep political polarization that, that we live in right now. Um, and so question is, how do you, how do, how do you um, balance that when you are making objectively based arguments for, as you did today, um, the fact that our government is under-resourced in important ways when it comes to uh, safeguarding us. Uh, uh, that would be seen by some as a quote-unquote political statement. Um, the, um, the values that you emphasized on sustainability are going to be seen by some as a sort of political position. So how do you navigate being out front on those things and still maintain the, not, not only the reality, but the perception of uh, being nonpartisan? Because so much of that is seen in partisan, through partisan lenses right now. Well, I think what distinguishes us is that we are science driven, that we conduct our testing, that we have engineers, that we do uh, rigorous um, survey research. Um, uh, and so what we are advocating for is based on the science and the facts. And we are very, very clear about that. And I think because we um, have that credibility and the nonpartisanship, we are able to sit at the table with either red or blue when it comes to safety, when it comes to... Now, of course, we are in a hyper-polarized environment, but I think our credibility forces us to resist the temptation to do to, 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 to begin to roll back from fact and science. I, I think that is, those are the arguments that we have to re-employ and push back into those debates. And I think based on the kinds of conversations that we're able to have and the growth, growth in membership, I think there is a longing and a desire and a hunger for science and fact. Now, I wanna push you a little bit harder on this if I could, and then I'll turn to a question from Eric Rogers, but um, there will be some people that will hear you invoking science and will say, well, I know where she's coming from politically when she uses that term. Do you ever, as an organization, in your internal meetings, do you say, gee, it would be kind of good for our credibility if we find a science-backed thing, finding that doesn't provide the appearance of pushing on the blue side of the equation, if you... Is that, is that question making sense? Grant, we are science driven, not science justified. Okay. Remember credibility above all, independence, uh, comparative testing uh, models, uh, I, 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 the, the ethics with which we do our work and the ethics within our culture, um, are, are so rock solid that, that um, I, I, I think science, uh, when, when, I, when I hear and you describe that science justification, that is anathema to any science-driven approach that we would, and, and we have to be clear and we have to cleave to that without question. Okay. Um, Eric Rogers uh, 
notes that at least his impression is that um, Europe is ahead of the United States in a lot of these areas. I know, particularly in terms of conversations about some of the larger digital organizations, the companies that you mentioned. Um, are, there, are there lessons that CR uh, is taking from Europe? Uh, and, and could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, what it's referring to is something called GDPR, and that was, it is a um, very strong privacy and, and digital online uh, regulatory infrastructure that, that we see in Europe. Not only is CR taking lessons from that, but um, some of those lessons are being infused into some of the, what we're seeing in states across the country. Now, what we have now is we do not have a federal uh, privacy law, online privacy law, but we are seeing some in this, some activity in the states. And so what I, I think that law was very influential in the California privacy law that um, is uh, enforced today. And I think you're gonna be seeing more of that. And our hope is that you're going to see pressure in the states, but uh, I, I, think, I think government as well as manufacturers we're, we're going to need not a patchwork of our own form of GDPR, but we need some form of that federal GDPR to protect consumers. So I think, I think it is having an impact. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're gonna see more states and more activity that are passing some of the notions that are now embedded in the European version. So I think it is having impact and it should. And do you think it will trickle up then this is one of these instances where things might trickle up? Trickle up well, you, from the states up. Absolutely, yeah. yes. I, I think uh, think about it. Uh, companies are going to want to have a uniform mm. privacy standards across where they're operating. It is going to be havoc if every state generates its own. And so we have some leaders. California is a leader. There are others that are working on it right now. And I think once we get a critical mass, we'll have more pressure to see a federal piece of legislation. That, mm. That's the thinking, that's the hope. Mm. Susan Edmondson wanted to know whether there are certain things that you think that government um, could be doing to, to help organizations like Consumer Reports um, push out on the public responsibility in this digital revolution age to you know, be, in a sense, you are partners to empower, better empower citizens? What kinds of things would you like to see government doing? Well, uh, we don't accept any government money. So um, <laughs> to the degree that we can help them do their jobs, that's is what we're going to do. And we're going to give them the information we think they need to know to get consumer the balance of power just right. Um, I think they could do more education. Uh, I One of the most recent, and I think, um, great innovations in government was the consumer, is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that uh, was an idea uh, that was given birth after the 2008 crash and the housing crisis and all the financial um, meltdown that consumers experienced in their livelihoods as a result of that. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we did not do a good job and the agency didn't do a good, good job of educating consumers about how important this is and generating the kind of databases they have around consumer harm. And I think, I think we, we have to, there, there's so many ways in which these agencies are helping consumers that we need to educate consumers about their value and about how they can make use of some of that data and how they can get, um, uh, millions of dollars were returned to consumers as a result of the CFPB's work. I don't think we've done a rigorous enough uh, job. And I think the prior, uh, the last time I spoke with um, Cordray, who was the, the um, head of the, the first director of the agency, I think he lamented that fact that you tend to get very inside the beltway and you forget that not, uh, that that's, Consumers need to see the value. And we have a job to do in communicating the value of government agencies for consumer power. Mm. Minch Lewis wanted to hear more about whether there have been times and how they have played out where 
businesses have really actively pushed back against your findings and have tried to impeach them and and or or try to open up avenues of communication with your organization to head off essentially bad reports all of the above Uh, the, The pushback comes with the territory when you're taking on these behemoths, you know, and and this goes dates back to to the early days of CR. Um, but we are going to the table armed to the teeth with data. And the first response most of the time is a pushback. And then we walk them through the data and we walk them through the protocols and we say, this is what we found out. Sometimes we actually do that. Again, it, it's not just a naming and shaming game. Sometimes mm. there, there's, there's a real value in sitting down and saying, this is what we've learned. Mm. And, uh, and just wanted you to know, we're gonna go to print on this tomorrow. Uh, do you have a point of view about this? And so when that thing comes to print, you get a pushback and then lo and behold, a week later, they come out with a press release saying the, it's been fixed. Um, or we've taken it off the market. Now in a hardware world where you find a fault with a product that kicks in recalls, something's taken off the market. What we've learned in a software world when we dinged Tesla for a faulty braking system in one of their cars was they did an over the air fix to address the problem. When the Samsung phones were exploding they did an automatic shutdown of those phones. It was the first time in history you had a 100% recall of a dangerous product. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of good and, and possibility and potential for doing uh, less harm. But uh, I think we're okay with getting beaten up a little in the press if two months, two weeks down the line, we see the fix. And if we don't see the fix, we just keep hammering away at it. Um, mm-hmm. It's really remarkable in 85 years, uh, the, the paucity of lawsuits. Uh, I think that tells you something. Again, cleaving to facts, rigor, protocols, research, testing uh, has been very effective. And regarding your comments about, and it's related to your answer there, but to the Uh, effort to uh, see change further upstream that you mentioned. Uh, And you and I talked about this before, but I'm curious to, to, to hear. And and I, and I think, I think the folks here would be interested to hear you uh, reflect on this. Uh, There are so many sources of, of misinformation, deliberate and not deliberate uh, out there. And uh, how do you avoid just sort of kind of falling into the trap of, of just playing defense all the time? I mean, how do you, you know, just, just sort of correcting bad information out there uh, and actually leveraging change and get the bandwidth to, 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 to create that space of, of action? Well, a couple of things, and I tried to hint at this, this is a really big problem and it's going to take uh an ecosystem uh, of folks on the nonprofit side, but also government and a corporate responsibility. I think there are a lot of interesting ideas out there. Uh, the whole notion of, of nutrition labels, that there is a browser plugin and that you get um, real time uh, alerts about you know, the, the, the veracity of the site that you're on. Um, and there are a number of experiments going on with that quite a bit. The experiment that we're running in this notion of upstream impact uh, around products and services is really interesting. So for example, if we, uh, in cars, for, exa- uh, for instance, you know, we, we, there was a, a gear shift problem that was dangerous if, uh, you know, if you're in the wrong gear and, and you have an accident and, and lives are lost. But we saw the problem in one uh, manufacturer, but it's a problem across many. And in the past, we would be having a discussion with a manufacturer, walking them through, um, trying to 
get agreement on, okay, well, this is the problem we found. But by looking at that data and making it available um, to experts, right, what we, what we are able to package for consumers is really for a consumer audience. The consumer audience is interested in a very small portion of so much of the data and the detail that we have. If we can use that data, that expert level data uh, for subscribers who are regulators, who are manufacturing engineers who are looking at product quality, then they're looking at a range of data over time. And you can course correct and include that data and those insights in the design upstream. So that, that's the theory uh, mm -hmm. behind that. And I think uh, we've already seen some examples of, of some things. Um, and I think we're going to see more. And I believe that being able to translate that data into insights that put consumers first is going to be a game changer. Because think about the speed with which products are being designed, put on market, taken off market. Um, look at the way in which software is embedded into cars and updated you know, constantly. Uh, if we're not in that upstream, if we're not present in the upstream, I, I think five years from now, we're, we're where were you suggested. We're behind, mm -hmm. not ahead. We always have to be thinking five years. Where's the market going to be in five years? What is what is consumer safety? We would have never thought about consumer safety as being an on your online presence. You know, how are you? Are you safe enough? Are you secure enough? Are you controlling your data? Is it private? Um, that's that dynamic. You know, is, is a software world dynamic. So I think the upstream impact is critical. It's critical for us to be as innovative as data, uh, have that kind of data analytics muscle so that we can be at the table. Hmm. Let's go back to Europe again uh, and think beyond data privacy, but uh, just take the whole array of consumer products, pharmaceuticals, food, other things. Um, Where's the US in, in comparison to Europe there? Are you seeing anything that's happening uh, in Europe that, that you think could be uh, uh, usefully applied here? Well, I also sit on the board of Consumers International and mm. that was actually an organization that Consumer Reports helped found many, many years ago. And so I'm able, and I'm also on the board of an international testing organization. So we sit down uh, and these are other consumer organizations, nonprofit consumer organizations that do very similar things to what Consumer Reports does. And I would say that um, their heads are spinning also as a result of the digital marketplace. And while they have GDPR, there's also a lot of change that has to happen uh, in order to be present in, in a marketplace, uh, a digital marketplace, and to secure the kinds of you know, opt-outs that um, privacy laws represent. So I would say that there are no global boundaries to the mm -hmm. digital marketplace. So it's, it's, um, it's a very familiar place. Now, somebody uh, interpreted uh, WTF in the context <laughs> of cable television and Specifically, we're in a spectrum area, so uh, it obviously it, it 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 appears to have touched a nerve with this uh, listener uh, in thinking about um, what to do at a local level uh, to push back against what is perceived by this person anyway to be some pretty unfair practices by the local cable company. I mean, sharing the bills is really interesting uh, and seeing how different places leverage the fees and what's hidden, what's not hidden. But is there anything that that, that people acting at a more local level can do about this? Um, one of the folks that, 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 that works in the Campbell Institute is particularly adept at negotiating uh, with their cable company to get better rates, but not everybody is going to have that skill. So no, what do you no, do? No, well, two things. Um, when we had to close our enterprise as a result of COVID, 
Um, I was living in New York City with my elderly parents, so we packed everybody up and moved upstate. Uh, fortunately, we had a place we could go to. And guess what? We did not have um, we did not have cable. And so I got into a back and forth and had to organize my rural road and neighbors to do exactly what your colleague did, negotiate and figure out a way to get cable. That is no way um, to create access to, um, to everyone. And that is why we're pushing so hard for broadband access. Um, that's what we need to do. Um, the companies that, the monopolies, you know, right now I don't have choice. I'm reliant on one cable company, as you probably are. Mm -hmm. And the service is not great. Um, and we are being taken advantage of. And so we are seeing a lot more energy and focus and desire for, for broadband access. And I think I think we're going to make progress on that. So that's uh, one of our top priorities. Um, we, we need to do better there. Well, one of the problems that you just cited there is that if, if that becomes the terrain on which these battles are fought, then you know some folks are, are, are going to be uh, better able to, to win and, and, to, and to get some traction than other folks. And it, it brings up for me the question of, on the one hand, you want people to become empowered and you are trying to empower them. On the other hand, for disadvantaged communities, they need to have people speaking on their behalf in part because they don't have some of the same resources. And so could you talk a little bit about how, how you at CR think about navigating that, doing things for, which need to be done for, but trying to get folks to, to do themselves. And then just more generally, some of the things that CR has been trying to do along the lines of greater inclusion and um, paying more attention to diversity and so on. Well, let's let's stick with the example of, of, of broadband. Um, uh, we like to say that we work with and for consumers, right? It's 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 in concert with our, our power comes from the six million plus people who um, who are working with us and and I think providing an enormous amount of, of consumer power locally and federally. But let's not kid ourselves. Um, how, how much negotiating can you do if you don't have broadband access and you're reliant on one because we have a system that is not funding universal broadband access. That has to be a priority for any consumer driven organization. And it has to be for us. So, so it, it, is, it, it is all those things. It's, um, it's one thing to educate yourself if you don't have the technology uh, and and you you have to build consumer power in order to demand that technology. And we know that the communities, by and large, that do not have that technology are some of the communities hardest hit by COVID because those children were not online. Mm -hmm. So that that comes with the, the um, working with and for consumers. It's both of those things. I think um, I think we've seen that more success comes not from bifurcating that, but using our expertise in Washington, but also growing that movement from the bottom up and across communities. And now I think we have, an, we have a more vibrant ecosystem, not just Consumer Reports, but many other organizations um, that are also fighting for this and demanding this as a right, as a consumer right that we need to be connected. We have to have our, our um, our communities online and connected in a digital world for all the reasons that we've discussed. So we have to move away from it being an option and something that you elect because you live in this certain kind of community versus right. Hmm. And, and I, I can't think of a better example than broadband. I want to try to squeeze in two more questions here before we end. One's very specific. Um, 
Um, and then I want to come back to something that you talked to the students about in a, in a smaller group uh, meeting earlier today, because I think it's very important and, and uh, will, will be of interest to folks. But first question from Robert um, Mendelsob, very specific here. He's concerned about the expanding promotion of natural food supplements that aren't supported by their producers. They're not regulated by the FDA. They're not supported by major drug and mass retail chains that sell them. Um, he wants to know, is that a microcosm of the problem of placing money before the public interest? And is this an area of concern for consumer reports? Well, we do a lot of work on in the area of supplements that are totally unregulated and labels like natural, which mean nothing. Mm. There is no defined standard of what natural means and can mean. It is a marketing label. And, uh, and, and that is very much uh, something that's been on our, um, on our top priority. And uh, I would say the, the issue that we do every year on supplements is one of our most popular. And folks, we know the supplement market is growing. And we know that uh, it, they're, they're not, many of them aren't safe, many of them are, but they're not. And so we continue to do that testing and, to pro and, and support that work and use that testing to create change uh, in the FDA and in the processes and in the food and drug. But I, I, th I think he put his finger on um, a perpetual problem that we have to stay on top of and that is supplements and this, this, you know, growth of, of all things natural, which means nothing, absolutely mm -hmm. nothing. There are labels that do, and we've succeeded in, in, in the organic label. There are, there are a number of organic labels, and we give consumers a lot of direction on what to search for, but natural means nothing. So final question, I want to return to where you started here, uh, uh, this afternoon, talking about your own story, and um, with the students, we had a we had a wonderful small group session um, earlier today. And again, thank you for making the time to do that. But you spoke in in pretty personal terms about your experiences as a Latino woman um, leading a large organization that you know historically hasn't necessarily been associated with uh, uh, with people of color. Um, could you just talk a little bit about your experience as a, as a, as a, a, a woman of color in a leadership position um, such as you hold and, and lessons that you may have taken from that? Um, well, take it in any direction you want, but uh, I just think folks would be interested to hear a little bit more about that. Well, this is a, we're, we're you know, on a Zoom at Syracuse University. And I would say that education was the number one building block, and it needs to continue to be the number one building block to empower and grow the kinds of leaders um, that we need to see in the kind of marketplace uh, and country that we live in today, which is very different from the one 85 years ago when Consumer <laughs> Reports started. And um, I was really compelled to come to an organization like this whose values are still incredibly relevant, but the way in which we achieve that mission had to change. We had to think about the populations most at risk. We had to think about the communities we we're trying to reach. And I think there are many organizations like that. And um, there may be um, many that we, our new startups, but as I said to the students, I said there are many "quote unquote" legacy organizations that we know of today that perhaps, when we think of them, we don't think of organizations on the cutting edge of representing the very complex web of of populations, diversity, aspirations that we see in the U.S. today. And that makes it doubly important for the students to have an appetite for transformation and for change to ensure that our work is not in vain. And, and so I think it's been a tremendous opportunity to be a trailblazer uh, and to make that kind of change happen. Uh, and it has to live beyond all of us. Um, 
it's a constant. Uh, you, you have backsliding in every area uh, of change that we try to put our finger on. But um, I, I just really appreciate the kinds of values, the ethical leadership that the Maxwell School is all about, because that is precisely what should be driving the change that we see. Commitment to servant leadership, ethical leadership, science-driven, fact-based, not justified. Uh, I, I think we have to cleave to that. And, and so what I think is you are paving the way for, uh, the, for, for an abundance of the kinds of leadership leaders that we, we need to see. Well, we are aspiring to produce leaders like yourself. And I just want to say that this has been, first of all, a very timely and important conversation. We really have appreciated you sharing your insights with us. And I wanna thank you, not just for the time that you've taken to be with us here today, but for your life of public service and uh, your leadership uh, over the years. And uh, we want you to keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> so Marta, it's just been, it's just also been a personal thrill uh, for me to, to have you be speaking in this series. So thanks so much for all of that, really do. Well, thank you, thank you. And I hope you'll all tune in to CRO.org uh, and um, tell me what you think. All right. It's a we pleasure will to that. be here. Thank you, Marta. Thanks. Thanks everybody for thanks everybody for uh, attending.